Was Destiny's Child singing about Billy Napier? He's a survivor. You are Locked On SEC, your daily podcast on the Southeastern Conference. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to Locked On SEC. It's great to have you guys along on today's show. We're going to talk about the latest over at Florida with Billy Napier and the Gators. Our buddy Brandon Olson will join us. I'm Chris Gordy. Thanks for making Locked On SEC your first listen every day. Shout out to every Gators. We're free and available wherever you get your podcasts and on YouTube, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, covering your team every day. Today's episode brought to you by FanDuel. Remember, now through September 22nd, all FanDuel customers, you, you can bet $5, get a three-week free trial of NFL Sunday Ticket from YouTube and YouTube TV. Visit FanDuel.com today to get started. All right, our buddy Brandon Olson joins us to talk all things Florida Gators. Brandon, I knew we'd be visiting a good bit this season, but on a scale of 1 to 10, how shocked are you that Billy Napier, as of this moment, is still the head coach of the Florida Gators following their 33-20 to 20 home loss to Texas A&M? I'm going to say six, um, mostly because I think the administration and the UAA at the University of Florida are absolutely spineless. Um, and, and so it doesn't fully shock me that they that they haven't essentially pulled the trigger here. Um, and like you said, you know, you, you can liken the, the Destiny Child survivor all you want. I'm more of a TLC guy. I don't want no scrubs coaching my football program. And yet here we are. Um, let's hear a little bit. Billy Napier did speak with the media Monday morning. And by the way, he was 30 minutes late. A guy who preaches, um, you know, it's about the little things and it's about, you know, but the guy just keeps showing up late to his Monday press conferences. Uh, yeah, the, the details it's in the little details. Yeah. Just keep showing up late. Here was Billy Napier asked about, um, his future and, and where things are. Questions that we have here. Have there been any discussions or you've been told anything about your future? No, none. Do you, do you feel like there's still a path to earn a fourth season if the team can get it together and yeah, hundred percent get on a roll? One hundred percent. So that was Billy Napier's response. Um, I mean, you're surprised. Like it, it feels like he's trying to do the oh, it's business as usual. There's nothing happening here. But I mean, like. The noise is getting louder, Brandon. Yeah. Um, I don't know if those conversations have been had with him. But I can guarantee you that those conversations have been had. And as far as the fourth season thing goes, I don't see it. I just, I, I just, I really don't see it. I understand the whole, oh, well, we can't just keep firing coaches every three years. I think year three is a is a decent time. Maybe you don't know if the guy's the coach that'll win you a natty in year three, but I think year three is a time where you can know that the guy won't win you a natty. And Billy Napier, in the year where everybody was pushing, well, he's got his guys now. It's no longer Napier guys. It's no longer Mullen guys. It's his guys. The top two offensive linemen on the team, the only – Two good offensive linemen on the team right now are Jake Slaughter and Austin Barber, who struggled against Texas A&M. Both Mullen guys, um, which is something. Uh, you have your two main players at F, or Tyreek Sapp and Justice Boone. Mullen guys. Your corner one, Jason Marshall Jr. Mullen guy. Uh, you have one of your linebackers that plays a good amount, Derek Wingo. Mullen guy. You had Khalil Jackson starting at wide receiver until he got hurt and will miss the rest of the year. Mullen guy. So I don't I don't know where this is coming from with, with oh, it's all his team. They're going to be so good when some of the best players on that team right now are Mullen guys. Um, so I don't I don't know if this is an evaluation issue or if this is a straight up talent issue or a development issue. What I do know is that no matter what you want to market as. It's a coaching, a coaching issue, and we're in year three, and this has been a complete failure to this point. Um, I think that Florida, and I've said this for years now, the way that Florida handles PR, specifically for football under Billy Napier, has been horrible. Uh, they, they just look like a clown show. You know, the, the Jaden Rashada stuff, the Marcus Stokes situation. Every time, every year, there's some kind of 
incident where everyone looks at Florida and goes, yeah, they're, that's Florida. They're just a clown show. They're always in the media here. And it's horrendous how it's been handled. There's rumors about one of your defensive coordinators with, with some off-field issues that uh, will eventually come to light, I'm sure. But your on-field looks horrible. Your off-field isn't great either. I, I don't know what is the hesitancy here. And I was someone that all off-season, I said, you know, this is going to be the year where we figure out if, if Napier can do it. There's two outcomes. He either proves to you that he deserves another year and can earn that, or he proves to you he doesn't deserve that. And week one was the day that I said he's done. Um, that Miami loss was heartbreaking. Texas A&M loss was heartbreaking. And the thing that really pisses me off is it's not a like the swamp used to be one of the most feared places to come in and play. And two power four opponents have come in, outscored you 74 to 37. If you combine those scores, you still lose to Miami. If you combine those scores, you still barely beat Texas A&M. And both teams were gator chomping after touchdowns against you. It's not even that they don't fear it anymore. They just don't respect it anymore. And I think that's because they don't respect you as a coach. Like many people don't. Uh, It's just, it's a horrible time right now. And it's weird. I mean, because he's the offensive minded guy, right? So, I mean, it'd be one thing to go, well, the defense is putrid. Okay. Maybe, you know, Andrew Armstrong is not a great hire and all that. But, like, for the offense to be as bad, and I want to kind of just review a little bit from this past week, you know, we we come off the Sanford game. We're going, all right, look, DJ Lagway looked every bit of a five star. They go into this game saying, no, Mertz is still the starter, but we're going to play both. And they basically like alternate series. Now, everybody knows. That's a recipe for disaster with any two system quarterback. You know, it just doesn't work, right? You almost have to like just throw Lagway out there and say, We're all in with him. Throw Mertz out there and go, We're all in with him. Like to do the alternating thing doesn't work for anybody. And at least from what I watched with this game, it just looked like neither guy could get the offense going consistently. Yeah, it's one of those. I I liken it to the office where everybody goes, Oh, if you have two QBs, then you have none. And I liken it to that scene in the office when gets promoted to uh the co-manager with michael and he's like oh yeah like every every office has two managers every office has the, name a country without two presidents where would catholicism be without the popes and that kind of thing it's, it's just complete nonsense that they're trying this um it makes no sense to me i understand that Graham Mertz is highly respected and i, I mean no disrespect to Graham Mertz when i say this just simply put dj lagway is the better quarterback for this offense he's better out of structure and your offensive line has consistently given up pressure this year. And and when you have one guy that can move and make a play and one guy that loves the dong ball, and that's the same guy, that's who should be your starting quarterback. Because Graham Mertz, to this point, has not played well. And I don't know about you, Gordy, but if I have two options and one of them has not played well as the veteran, one of them has played well sometimes, hasn't played well others, Even if they're both bad, I'd rather play the bad young guy where he can develop and get better instead of the bad old guy. And that's a problem that we've seen with quite a few positions on this Florida Gators roster right now where it seems like there are bad veteran starters. And even if you play a young guy, even if they're bad, you're getting bad regardless. You might as well give it to the guy that's going to be here next year. And uh, it was Anthony Schwartz, who used to play receiver for Auburn. So the same thing about Peyton Thorne and Hank Brown before Hank Brown got named the starter. He was like, look, if they're both going to be be bad, at least play the guy who's going to be here next year. And that should be the approach. Yeah, it's it's tough because there's there's and I can see the other side of it. Right. We want to default to the to the veteran like Graham Mertz has been the veteran. He's been in the, he's been in the trenches. He started a bunch of games in Wisconsin. So we're going to lean on that veteran leadership to beat a good A&M defense. Um, you know, on the flip side, also, you know. Oh, the young guy, if you destroy his confidence right out of the gates, you know, he may never develop to to what he wants to be. So I understand those arguments, but I'm with you. Like you're a Florida fan. You got so excited about this recruiting class. You lose all those recruits right before signing day. But the one you held on to was Lagway and he was exciting. And we saw it against Samford. Look, did we think he was going to do against A&M what he did against Samford? No, but I just wonder how different would it have been if you had just given him the keys for the whole game? Let him learn from his mistakes. He's going to throw interceptions. He's going to do things like that, but at least let him get these games under his belt. Getting a series here, a series there to me, 
you know, you'll you'll never find out what he is this year if you don't roll with him. Yeah, it's also important to remember that when you look at this Texas A&M game, A&M started with the ball, kicked a field goal, Graham Mertz came in, they punted, A&M gets the ball again, they score a touchdown, and so by the time DJ Lagway ever came into the game, he was down 10 nothing right away. His first drive's 10 nothing already. Uh, the, the Florida Gators had, I believe it was like like 12 offensive plays in the entire first half before their final drive. It was just bad football throughout. Um, and honestly, the offense was was pretty bad against Texas a and My bigger issue was the defense, and it was, it was especially frustrating because if anybody wants to go back to Lockdown Gators on Thursday or Friday, I sat there and I was just like, I, I'm more concerned about Texas A&M's offense against Florida's defense because – I think that Colin Klein, the OC at Texas A&M, won a hell of an offensive coordinator. I think he schemes up run game better than almost anybody in the country. He reminds me of Chip Kelly in that way with, with the run game that he schemes up. And mobile quarterbacks give you an issue. And I was talking about Connor Wigman, and then the backup comes in, and Marcel Reed's like, oh, if it's just running, I, I can handle that easily. And that's what he did. Um, it, it, it's, it's horrendous. You've got guys making seven figures on your defensive staff and you can't field an even competent defense right now. And, and that's just embarrassing and pathetic. And yet another show for why Billy Napier, it, it, the job's bigger than Billy. I, I don't mean to insult Billy. I don't mean to, I don't know him as a person to insult him as a person, but I, I can tell you that the job is bigger than Billy Napier can handle right now. And for me, that's the easiest sign to just go, all right, then, then it's over. Like we tried it. We, we bought in, we, we tried everything but the job's bigger than Billy Napier is capable of handling right now. When will the plug be pulled? We'll talk about that more next with Brandon Olson here on Locked on SEC, part of Locked on Podcast Network, covering your team every day. More with Brandon Olson here in just a second, but I want to let you guys know about a new sponsor on board with us. It is Roy. If you have not heard about Roy yet, it stands for Return on You. And it's a new platform that lets you, the fans, get involved in NIL like never before by making contributions directly to your favorite athletes. By supporting players directly, you can help shape rosters, retain talent, and keep your favorite athletes out of the transfer portal. As you all know, NIL has changed the game for athletes. Roy changes the NIL game for fans. And here's why Roy, here's why Roy is different. Directly support players. Roy allows fans to directly back their favorite college athletes with Roy, fans can play a key role in shaping the future of their favorite teams while athletes maximize their name, image, and likeness potential. Go download Roy on iOS or Android and enter referral code Locked On, and you will automatically be entered into a sweepstakes to win $5,000 catch. Uh, uh, join Roy.com for more details. No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited. Support the players. Change the game with Roy. All right, we continue here on Locked On SEC Talk with Brandon Olson, host of Locked On Gators. And uh, Brandon, the question now becomes when will, the, you know, it's it's a matter of when, not if. Um, there's a little hope for Billy Napier to turn this thing around at one and two with still a road trip to Tennessee, a game against Kentucky, a game against Georgia, road trip to Texas, home against LSU, home against Ole Miss. Uh, at Florida State's looking more winnable by the week, but um, you know, the question now is when do you pull the plug? An SEC road trip this week to Mississippi State. Now, they're going through their own struggles. Jeff Levy, I mean, fans are ready to fire him. He hasn't even got through a, halfway through a season. Toledo, yeah, 3-0. and Maybe it's just Toledo's really awesome. I mean, maybe that's the case. But uh, if they, if Florida, even if they go win at Mississippi State, I don't know if that's buying you much hope. And then you get into a bye week before UCF comes to town. Is it as simple to say... If they lose at Mississippi State, he will not be the head coach come next Monday, right? I mean, I want to say that, but I also thought that any loss in week three would lead to your firing, let alone a terrible, like like it was 33-20, but it felt so much worse than that. I mean, Texas A&M didn't throw the ball a single time in the entire fourth quarter. Because they didn't have to. Um, and, and so stuff like that. But I, I honestly, and and you got Scott Strickland on the screen right now. He's another guy. That that right there should be a LinkedIn ad for both of those two. Because neither of them are fit for this job. Um, neither of them should be here right now. I don't know what the tan suit was for. I don't know what he was going for there, Billy. But um, it was rough to see 
it, it was rough to watch. I personally, I would have fired Billy after the Texas a and game. Um, and I, I don't take it lightly. I want to make that clear for the people that don't know me. I don't take it lightly to call for someone else's job. It's just at this point, you've proven you can't do the job. And so I would get rid of him, get a head start on your coaching search, get a head start on trying to salvage whatever you can from this recruiting class where early signing day is now December 4th and it, it's way up. Um, I would like to imagine, and this, this is me trying to cope, I think, with an incompetent administration and UAA. Um, I'd like to imagine that the thought process is win or lose against Mississippi State. You go out there and fire Billy the day after and or even the night of. I don't care. You go out there and you say, hey, we're going to head into the bye week and, and go with our interim there. Um, and then we'll finish the season with the interim while we do our coaching search. Because the Mississippi State game also won. You're actually favored on the road, which is nuts considering how bad you've looked, especially on the road. But if you beat Mississippi State, congratulations, you won a game you're supposed to win against a team that just got dominated by a Mac school. The best Mac school. But I want to throw that one out there. I don't care about Northern Illinois. It, Toledo's the best Mac school. Um, but got dominated by a Mac school group of five program, at which I don't care if it's one of the better group of five programs you're an SEC team that shouldn't happen to you. And it did. So you either beat a team that just got blown out by a Mac school, or if you go in there and lose the game, then you lose to a team that just got blown out by a Mac school. Uh, I don't think that it's one of those situations where it matters if you win or lose, and it shouldn't matter if you win or lose this game. Uh, my hope is that we will see it at the bye week. And if not, I think of Billy Napier as a head coach, you lose to UCF. And I think if you lose to UCF, you need to be fired on your way into the locker room. Yeah, yeah. Because I mean, you, look, you, you can't you can't lose to all the Florida the schools in the state this year. Um, who? Okay, real quick, Devils advocate. Just they they fired Napier. Who are you making the interim coach? Because there's no good option. <laughs> like, there, there's really not. Um, my my thought process here. It's not even a, a what what I do. It's what I think would happen based on some things that I've been told and some things are just me trying to read the tea leaves. I am expecting at this point Dan Enos to be the interim head coach. Um, he is an analyst right now. Yeah, no, I'm not thrilled about it either. It's just you know what we've been uh, what we've been told, and so I think Dan Enos would be the interim coach for now. I think Rob Sale, the offensive line coach, would be fired. Offensive line coach slash co-OC would be fired. Jonathan DeCoster, the other offensive line coach, would have full control of the O-line. He came over from the Browns last year, one of the best offensive lines in the NFL. Hopefully he can take some of those coaching points and build it together there. Russ Callaway calling plays is your tight ends coach and co-offensive coordinator. Defensive coordinator, fire Ron Roberts. Give Austin Armstrong back the play calling duties and see what you can do there. See if you could salvage anything there. Um, but that would be what I think the approach would and probably should be. Uh, not so much should the Dan Eno stuff, but that's how it's been explained to us at this point. So that that's my expectation there. But again, there's no good interim option. Um, yeah. Mike Peterson, he's at least a Gator. I don't think he's a good coach, but he's at least a Gator. So, so maybe you go with that. But uh, I don't think that there's a good interim option that's currently on your staff, whether it's your coaching staff or your support staff. Yeah, Ron Roberts got the title of executive head coach and co-DC coming over from Auburn, and Auburn's defense was good last year. I'm I'm so shocked that he hasn't been able to help Austin Armstrong, but, you know, maybe it's butting of heads and two different philosophies going at it. Uh, Jabbar Jaluk, also running backs coach, has the title of associate head coach, so I don't know, but there's no there's no just obvious guy that like, oh, that's the easy interim if, if you fire Napier, but you're right. A lot of times you fire the head coach, you also let go of the OC, the the DC, you know, whoever it is, uh, there's multiple fires made um, sometimes in those situations. All right, Brandon, last thing for you. Let's do it because we, we did it last time. It's just going to be talked about all, all season long with the early signing period, December 4th. I mean, you make a fire, you got to start talking to agents immediately and start feeling this thing out. The problem becomes, who do you want? Well, Lane Kiffin's probably going to have Ole Miss set up for a playoff run. Um, you know, any other big name, talk about, you know, Dan Lanning at Oregon, they're probably going to, like you talk about some of the biggest names you're, you're going to want to target. 
are all going to be in the running for a playoff going, I don't have time to entertain you, Florida. I've got this team getting ready for a playoff run. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that, that's the fun part about this, right? Um, I think Dan Landing is off the table. As much as I love him, I, I don't think he's an option. Um, I do think Elaine Kiffin would at least be contacted from Florida. I mean, he's he's been interested before. Jimmy Sexton called Florida when Dan Mullen got fired, and that, that was a thing for Lane. Um, and Florida chose Billy Napier, um, which is like, you know how when, when you're house training a dog and, and they pee on the floor and you like hold their nose in it, and you go, that's bad. That's what you should do with Scott Strickland and Elaine Kiffin passing up to hire Billy Napier's point. And you, know, you don't do that. Um, it was rough stuff there, but I would imagine Lane gets the call. Buyout's not too bad. He's always had some some kind of desire for Florida. I don't know what it is, but he's always had some kind of desire for the Florida job. I'm curious if you can have that conversation with him and say, hey, like we, we're going to hire you. And because of the recruiting stuff, the early signing day, I feel like you kind of have to announce it early and kind of just go, hey, you're just going to go like go through the playoff as Ole Miss's head coach. We'll handle recruiting as your as your underlings, I guess. We'll handle recruiting with you as a selling point contract signed, so you can't back out of it like the Auburn stuff. Um, and, and we'll handle that. I don't think there are many good options for Florida Gators fans right now because I think a lot of Florida Gators fans want proven power four coach, offensive minded, good recruiter, and that is such a small pool. Yeah, that's what that, that's what Lane Kiffin and and Lincoln Riley. And that's kind of all you have right now. So Jed, Jed Fish's name gets thrown out there because of the ties to Florida, but he just, you know, moment in the moment now, he just lost to Washington State. So it's like he's not very safe, but he did do a good job at Arizona. But, you know, is that the, is that the home run hire, you know? Not, not at all. I honestly, and this is my like the Charlie Day conspiracy theory little meme of him with the, with the conspiracy board is hire Urban Meyer for a year or two. <laughs> get get him back into the ring of like get him into the ring of honor. He wants to do it. Like he wants to be in the ring of honor. Give him a reason to to get into good graces. Hire him for a year or two. Hire an OC under him. Have that OC trained to be the new head coach. Move Urban into assistant GM role or some kind of front office role where he could still be the recruiting maniac that he is, and he could still handle all that. And then when he's ready to step away, you hire that new OC up to be the head coach and and hope that that's the approach. But even then, that's still kind of a band-aid, right? I, I think Florida's in a really bad spot if you want that proven winner at the power four level that, that can coach an offense and recruit. I think it's just a really bad cycle to need a proven top candidate. Brandon, great stuff as always, man. Let everybody know where they can find your stuff. Yeah, uh, you can find Lockdown Gators every day. Something tells me that there might be additional episodes coming up, maybe a few emergency live shows. You know, they, things happen. Uh, but find me with Lockdown Gators and New York Giants on SI. Brandon, great stuff. I, I, I just got a feeling we're going to be talking again real soon, all right? Yeah, something tells me that too. All right, still more to come here on Lockdown SEC, part of the Lockdown Podcast Network, covering your team every day. Hey, this episode presented to you by our friends over at FanDuel. You've heard us talk a lot about FanDuel all throughout this summer. They're still America's number one sports book, and they got a little something different going for you right now. Now through September 22nd, all FanDuel customers can bet $5 and get a three-week free trial of NFL Sunday ticket from YouTube and YouTube TV. Then with a YouTube TV base plan, you'll be able to watch every regular season Sunday afternoon out-of-market game. All you need is... Is a Google account and a current form of payment you can cancel anytime. And of course, they got all the betting lines up there for you each and every week across the SEC. All the biggest games, even the smaller games, they got there for you. Visit fanduel.com. They are America's number one sports book. Remember, go bet $5, get that three week free trial of NFL Sunday ticket from YouTube and YouTube TV. Visit fanduel.com and download the app today. All right, roll along here, Locked On SEC, part of the Locked On Podcast that we're covering your team every day. We got some SEC news and notes that we need to get into, so let's dive right into it. As the uh, SEC announced their football players of the week for SEC Week 3 yesterday, offensive players of the week, it was a tie, Jalen Milrow of Alabama and Jackson Dart of Ole Miss. 
both the quarterbacks, offensive players of the week, defensive Braden Swinson, defensive end over at LSU, and Raylan Wilson, Georgia linebacker, were named the defensive players of the week. Special teams went to Blake Craig, the Missouri kicker, doing his thing. Offensive line went to Trey Zoon of the Aggies at Texas A&M. Defensive line went to Tyrion Ingram Dawkins at Georgia and Jared Ivey of Ole Miss. And then your freshman of the week, how about two quarterbacks, the A&M quarterback and the Aggie quarterback, and not their starters, their backups, Arch Manning and Marcel Reed, named SEC Freshman of the Week. Pretty cool there. And, you know, let's see what happens with Quinn Ewers and Connor Wegman as we go along. But pretty interesting that uh, both the backup quarterbacks of the Longhorns and Aggies named SEC Freshman of the Week. All right, let's get to some other news and notes from Monday. Billy Napier, uh, of course, uh, we talked to Brandon Olson uh, on this show about all the uh, coaching rumors and all that, but got to figure out what to do as quarterback spot. And many fans been clamoring for DJ Lagway, but Billy Napier saying Monday, the plan right now will be Graham Mertz starting. And then DJ Lagway will get involved early in both halves. Then decisions will be made from there forward as play progresses. Billy Napier says, so the old mantra, if you got two quarterbacks, you got none. Well, they're going to play both quarterbacks, but uh, Graham Mertz is going to uh, start and they'll work in Lagway as the game goes along. Game against Mississippi State this weekend is one of Florida's few winnable games still on the schedule. But we said that about, you know, the uh, A&M game this past week. Thought they had a chance against Miami even in week one. But it'll be an early kickoff this coming Saturday on ESPN. Speaking of the Aggies, Mike Elko and his team excited after their win over Florida this past week. Elko meeting with reporters on Monday to talk about his quarterback situation. Connor Wegman uh, ahead of their week four game against Bowling Green. Here's what Mike Elko said. He said that Connor Wegman is going to be listed as day to day and week to week. Which to me is kind of a contradiction as if he's he's day to day. He's not week to week. If he's week to week, he's not day to day. But regardless, uh, he said, we will continue to manage the quarterback room in the same manner we have. Play the guy we feel gives us the best chance to win. He also said, we're going to get uh, re-imaging done on Connor Wegman to make sure there's nothing there that we're missing and make sure we have the right plan in place when it comes to his shoulder. Uh, He said, we'll sit down with our medical team this evening, come up with the right plan and course of action for this week. So, if, if you're listening to that, it sounds like obviously they're going to prepare for Marcel Reed to start again this week against Bowling Green. That'll be this Saturday night. But, you know, look, Marcel Reed played well. But the question is how many how many weeks will they need to go before Connor Wegman can come back? Certainly something to keep an eye on. But Bowling Green, they should be fine with Marcel Reed, a quarterback, to get the win there. Over at Kentucky, they're presumed starting running back Trip Chip Trainum. He's missed the first couple of weeks with a hand injury, and as they prepare for Ohio this week, Mark Stoops on Monday said he is not available this week. So in Trainum's absence, Kentucky has turned to senior running back Demi Sumo Karngbe, who has carried the load, and he's rushed for over 200 yards so far on this season, and his best game came this past week against Georgia. 22 carries for 98 yards, just missed 100 yards against Georgia, and um, Got to be the first time Kentucky's run that effectively against the number one team in the country in, in quite a while. Uh, Stoops also gave a shout out to offensive tackle Gerald Mincy. He said who played through injury on Saturday. He also said also the same with Maxwell Harrison. Wasn't feeling great with his shoulder and just played through it and played well. Uh, that'll be Kentucky versus Ohio scheduled for 1245 Eastern on the SEC Network this Saturday. Over at Arkansas. They have uh, been much improved offensively so far on the season. But uh, some injuries, Sam Pittman updating us on Monday. Most notably, he said starting cornerback Jalen Braxton suited up against UAB but did not play a single snap, still healing from a bone bruise. He said Braxton is likely likely to play against Auburn this weekend, so that's pretty significant for their defense. Also, Arkansas starting center Addison Nichols left Saturday's game against UAB after getting his ankle rolled early in the first quarter. Sam Pippen noted he was struggling in practice last week, but 
is better today than he was Thursday of last week. So that's one to keep an eye on. And then Hudson Clark, who left early in the Oklahoma State game with a back injury, he played just seven snaps, but he was Arkansas's highest graded defender against uh, the Cowboys that week. Finished the game with one pass breakup, but it looks like Razorbacks will be without him against Auburn this week. Over Tennessee, they are heading into Norman, Oklahoma on Saturday to take on the Sooners, a place that Josh Heupel knows very well, one of the most revered quarterbacks in Sooners history. And uh, Wes Rucker caught up with tight end Miles Kitzelman, who said Coach Heupel has not said anything to the team about this being a homecoming for him at Oklahoma this week. But that's not surprising because Heupel never makes anything about him. He said it's about Tennessee versus Oklahoma this week. Now, during his playing career at Oklahoma, Heupel was recognized as a consensus All-American, won numerous awards, led Oklahoma to the BCS National Championship in 2000. He did joke on Monday, though, that he's expecting a, quote, quiet, respectful crowd in Norman when the Vols meet the Sooners this weekend. Funny joke there from Heupel. How about over at LSU? They have a, an official kickoff time. We didn't mention that on yesterday's show, but this new uh, scheduling with the uh, – where you know it's going to be an afternoon game. You just don't know, like, what hour you're kicking the game off. Could be two, could be three. Well, the official game time has been announced as 2.45 LSU versus UCLA this weekend. So uh, I think it was between that and, like, 3.10. So it doesn't make much of a difference for LSU. But it'll be um, – that'll be this weekend on ABC. LSU versus UCLA. LSU – really make it hard on themselves. Well, <laughs> Ole Miss is playing Furman and Middle Tennessee and Wake Forest. LSU's playing USC and UCLA. Now, uh, the good news is for LSU, UCLA kind of stinks this season, so maybe they're getting them at the right time. But still, why would you do that to yourself? Go schedule a Citadel or Southeastern or something like that. Over at Auburn, Hank Brown looked very good as a freshman making his first career start on Saturday in the win over New Mexico. and. Uh, the Pro Football Focus College giving uh, the Auburn quarterback the fifth highest rating among Power Four quarterbacks in Week Three, right? ranking him above any other SEC quarterback in their pass grading system. He threw for 235 yards and four touchdowns to lead Auburn to a 45-19 route of New Mexico. And of course, uh, Hugh Free saying that they are going to stick with him this week. He said. Uh, or asked how long he'll stick with Hank Brown. He said, I don't know if it's, you know, we'll see. If he keeps playing well, it'll be a permanent fix. If not, maybe it wakes everybody else up, spurs them to be better, prepared, and make better decisions. He did uh, say, I've stood with Peyton Thorne, still believe he's a good football player, but uh, they're going with the hotter hand right now, and that's Hank Brown. So big game against Arkansas coming up this weekend. Over at Texas, Steve Sarkeesian talking to me yesterday, said running back Jaden Blue is seeing improvement as he works back to heal from a an ankle injury that he suffered in the win against Michigan. Sark couldn't say whether Blue will be available Saturday against Louisiana Monroe, but he did say Jaden's making good progress. Hopefully we can get him back. He's an impactful player, not only for us in the run game, but in the passing game. Now, look, this is a team that already lost C.J. Baxter you know, preseason for the year. They turned to the duo of Trey Wisner and Jared Gibson this past Saturday and did pretty well there. Um, yeah, could be backup running back, backup quarterback. I've not heard a definitive update on Quinn Ewers yet, but expect possibly Arch Manning to get the start against Louisiana Monroe this weekend for Texas. Over at Georgia, they're coming off a tough game, a tough win at Kentucky, a 13-12 to 12 win. And Joel Klatt on his Fox Sports podcast this week saying, uh, Look, this is what Georgia kind of does. He said, I understand we've seen this before. Maybe we could just pass this off and say, well, last year they trailed by 11 at the half to South Carolina. They were tied with Auburn with five minutes to go in the fourth quarter. In 2022, they went to Missouri. They were they only won by four on the road. He said, maybe just Georgia does this. But he said, Georgia cannot afford to just do this this year because the schedule is tougher. He said, Georgia was not playing the schedule that they're playing this year. So they're going to have to wake up and wake up very quickly. Over at Alabama, Jalen Milrow, he was named the Reese's Senior Bowl Offensive Player of the Week after his uh, showing up in Wisconsin. Kalen DeBoer updating us on some Alabama injuries on Monday. So Malachi Moore got a blow to the head. A lot of positive signs there with him already through the first couple of days, but he is in concussion protocol. 
Running back Richard Young, he said, I'm not sure on Richard. Got to evaluate him a little bit more. One other thing on Alabama, Kane Womack, defensive coach, uh, defense coordinator for Alabama. They've been very good so far defensively, but he thinks they can be even better. He uh, told reporters Monday, the numbers looked like we were dominant, but I didn't think we were as dominant as we were capable of being. So uh, he said one guy I think was pretty dominant it was LT Overton, who had six tackles in the game. One more Alabama Georgia note. Uh, news coming out yesterday, President Donald Trump uh, expected to attend the Georgia-Alabama game in week five. So that will just add even more hype and attention for the highly anticipated game. Both teams on a bye this week, both teams undefeated, and that is going to be huge buildup heading into next week for that game. So looking forward to getting to that one. All right, thank you guys for making Locked on SEC your first listen every day. Shout out to every dayers. Keep coming back and checking us out tomorrow on the show. Our buddy Chris Phillips, SEC Unfiltered, going to join us. We'll talk some SEC big picture stuff with him. And, hey, for your second listen, you can check out Locked On as long as the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube. You can check that out. And also check out Locked On College Football with uh, Spencer McLaughlin. You can make that your spe- second listen as well. Uh, check us out wherever you find your podcast. I'm Chris Gordy. This has been a Locked On SEC. You guys have a great day. We'll talk to you guys tomorrow. Thanks again to uh, Brandon Olson, Locked On Gators, for joining us.